Good to be here once again this afternoon with everyone. Good to see full house today. That's nice. You never know with the uh, challenging weather we have, how, who's going to make it and who doesn't. But uh, it's good to see everyone here. Well, as we're well aware that we're just about to observe a very special time of the year for God and, of course, for his children as well. And I'm speaking, of course, about the Holy Day cycle, which begins next week with the Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread. It is indeed a very meaningful time, a meaningful time for us, a sorrowful time in some respects, but also a very exciting and a very encouraging time in other respects as well. The annual Holy Days give us an outline, a complete outline of God's entire plan, His entire plan of salvation for mankind from the very beginning to the end. So when we come to understand that plan, we recognize that we have a part in it, don't we? We have a very much have an active part in that plan. Our involvement revolves or involves a responsibility to observe and to keep those days properly. It's a learning process, and we learn and we grow spiritually, of course, one step at a time. We grow little by little, don't we, year after year. Well, through this Holy Day season, we all hear messages that compare physical aspects to our spiritual lives. You know, we, the physical aspects or the physical uh, things we experience in our life, we see many parallels with our spiritual life as well. There's counterparts between the physical and the spiritual. Many things that we do physically teach us and reveal to us spiritual realities. And God created us, of course, as physical human beings, not only to test us and to prove us, but to enable us to learn more about Him to learn more about God through similar types that we experience again in our physical environment. For example, we're focused on the physical removal of leavening from our homes. We've been focused on that for a few days and probably a few weeks leading into this time. In the days ahead, we'll hear more about that, more about the lesson of that, that activity, which teaches us, of course, about examining ourselves spiritually and removing leavening or removing that leavening, which is indeed a symbol of sin in our lives. Well, there are many more physical experiences that we encounter in this life that can teach us important, very important spiritual lessons and principles if we take the time to stop and to think about them and to actually analyze them. So God created us with incredible minds that are indeed very intricate. They're very complex. They're able to perform thousands of connections every second, thousands of connections and responses to, to the stimulus that we receive. We take in, into our lives, throughout our entire lives, we take in information, and then our mind then categorizes that, it digests that, and it then forms responses to that intake. God also gave us what we call, of course, the spirit in man that separates us, separates us from the less, rest, rest of life on this earth. And it, that spirit of man then gives us a self-awareness, gives us the ability to think and to learn and to actually respond then to the information that we receive. And of course, we hope to respond in a very responsible way. Many simple repeated responses that our mind triggers for us over time, once we've learned a, an appropriate response, they come, become somewhat automatic. And we eventually then, of course, take them to, for granted but we can still learn some very important spiritual principles from those activities. And one such activity is the seemingly simple act of walking. I said that walking is indeed a simple act, but when we read about it and actually come to understand everything that's involved, it is very complex. It's a very complex process. I'd like to read to you uh, from an article I found online. It was written by two medical doctors. One doctor, Elizabeth Coe, and the other doctor was Eve Glazier. This is in response to a question that they had received when someone wrote in and asked, why is it so hard for someone to relearn how to walk? How is it so hard, why is it so hard to learn to, re, to relearn how to walk if you've actually lost that ability? Say someone suffered a stroke in their older, older years. And here's the response then that they uh, wrote back to this individual. They wrote, they said, once the excitement that accompanies our first baby steps dies down, we quickly take the ability to walk for granted. It's an accepted and actually an expected part of human development, and yet it is a remarkable feat. Walking is basically a series of tiny, controlled falls. Not only does each one require a complex combination of strength, 
balance and coordination to complete successfully, there's also the added challenge of stringing a series of steps together into a smooth and efficient gait. That means pushing off with one leg, reaching from the hip with the other, extending and then bending the knees, flexing the ankles and controlling the momentum of the fall by rolling through the foot. All of this is monitored by various nerve centers, which keep the hundreds of moving parts involved in constant synchronization. Add in the going, ongoing spatial awareness required to remain upright and na navigate ever-changing terrain, and it's little wonder that relearning to walk can have a very, very steep learning curve. Well, the article goes on and says that with modern technology, the technology that we have today of cameras and sensors and so on, it's been discovered that every part of every step is packed with tiny variations. The hips, the knees, the feet, the ankle, the spines, and the pelvis each tilt and shift and bend and swing in a slightly different way with each and every step, which requires then a series of continual minute adjustments to, main, to be able to maintain balance and to achieve a smooth gait. So the complexity of what we think of as a simple act, a simple act of walking, is truly amazing. That is why it is so very difficult for someone to, have, to actually relearn how to walk, especially when they're older and if they've suffered a stroke. Now, that's indeed a, a, an, amazing, an amazing explanation of, or a revelation, basically, of the amazing capabilities of this mind that God has given us. This mind that coordinates all of that, puts it all together and triggers responses, moves all the appropriate muscles in just the right amount to be able to enable us to actually to walk. And it's a very amazing, amazing thing. And we can learn some things from that. So what is indeed the message for us? Well, we all are hopefully growing spiritually right now, being prepared for positions in God's kingdom that God indeed hopes, and we hope as well, that we will actually be able to participate in in the future. Learning, of course, from our physical experiences is part of that process. Now, there's several examples in the Bible that show our growth and development as Christians can be associated with or actually compared to walking. But we, of course, have to learn to walk according to correct standards. We have to learn to walk according to correct standards. In researching some information for this sermon, I ran across a little article that talks about we're all familiar with little babies. You know, when they begin to, to walk, we call them toddlers, and that's it's because they toddle. And I read one article that said, you know, we have this uh, modern device where we put a baby in this uh, uh, baby walker where the baby can, uh, it's got wheels on it, and especially if it's on a hardwood floor, right, that child can really move with that thing. But the article says that's really a detriment in, in many respects to that child learning to walk because they don't use the proper muscles that they would normally use when they learn to walk correctly. So it affects their posture, it affects a lot of things. So we have to learn to walk correctly as well, don't we, in a, in a spiritual sense. A number, in a number of places in his epistles, we find that Paul admonishes us, us as members of the Church of God, to walk worthy, to walk worthy, to be counted worthy of our calling. An example is in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1. There Paul writes, he says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Now, as we look forward to the coming holy days and think about preparing for the roles in the kingdom of God that God hopes, us, hopes we will fulfill, let's explore what it means to walk worthy. What does it mean for us to walk worthy of our calling? And the title of the sermon today is Learning to Walk. Learning to Walk. In Ephesians chapter 4 that I just uh, read for you, came a very strong admonition from Paul. Paul wrote, he says, I beseech you, I beseech you to walk, to walk worthy of the calling. Now, beseech is indeed a strong word, exhorting or calling for someone to act and to actually do something. And he uses that same word in Romans chapter 12. So we're going to look, look at that verse. Romans chapter 12. We're going to look at verse 1. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1. Here we get, we find Paul uses the same word. 
Romans chapter 1, or 12, verse 1, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to, to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In other words, we need to learn how to walk correctly and properly. Now, this is an extreme urgency that is expressed here by Paul in, in the same word that Paul is using in uh, Ephesians chapter 1, where he said I, said, I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. And the word calling in that King James version, of the King James version there, is actually translated as vocation. Vocation. Walk worthy of the vocation with which you were called. Now, in all, all other places, that Greek word that is translated there in the King James Version as vocation, in all other places, it is translated, <coughs> it is translated as, as calling. So we find then, if it relates to a vocation, it can be similar. It can also mean a situation or actually a station in life. So we, we know what vocation means. We know that and understand the concept of a vocation. Vocation is a career that we prepare for in order to earn a living. Do we think of our calling in that type of a situation, in that type of a, a scenario? Something that we have to plan for, something we have to prepare for. Now, careers in medicine and law and engineering and a number of other fields require planning, and they require years of effort in order to be able to succeed at them. That is same true, of course, for many of the trades. We have electricians and plumbers and carpenters and so forth. And there's codes and standards that, and practices that must be adhered to in, in all of those. So very important that a lot of preparation, a lot of planning goes into that ahead of time. Our calling requires indeed a lifetime, a lifetime of preparation for which, it, of course, includes whatever time. That preparation includes whatever time each and every one of us might have left in this life. So we have to continue in that, continue with that preparation. That calling is an invitation. It's an invitation like an invitation to a banquet. And metaphorically, the phrase walk worthy or be counted worthy in the Bible applies to the divine call or the invitation to become part of God's kingdom. It is a priceless offer. It is a priceless offer that God has given to us and that we must be certain to walk worthy of in order to be able to partake of it. And so we have to be committed to be preparing ourselves for that. We have to do our part to get ourselves prepared so that we can be successful at it. But there's a mindset, a mindset that we must all have to begin with. Now, John, John the Baptist was indeed a very humble man. He was committed to God's way of life, and he recognized and he understood that he himself was not worthy, not worthy to even loose the strap of Christ's sandal. Now, we also understand that personally, from our own personal observation of the Passover and the Days of Unleavened Bread, that we too, we ourselves, are not worthy of what God indeed offers to us. We are not worthy of that. How then can we walk, how can we be counted worthy when we ourselves are not worthy? We all recognize the obvious, and the very short answer to that question is, it's only possible because of God's mercy. It's only possible because of God's love and through His Spirit, the power that He gives us, that a measure of His power that works in us. It's only through that that we have that potential, that opportunity to begin to walk worthy. And that, of course, all begins with the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us. Let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9. Second Timothy Chapter 1, actually we're, we're going to read verse 8, 8 and 9. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. Here Paul writes, he says, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, and of course, we can do nothing of ourselves to earn our salvation, but according to his own purpose, 
and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. We are all called, of course, to come out of this world. To come out of this world in a spiritual sense. We're to be separate from it, separate ourselves from it, and from the mindset that permeates the society in order to fulfill God's purpose, the purpose he has for us, and eventually, the same will be true, of course, for all of humanity. Eventually, everyone will have their chance and their opportunity. And yet, we struggle while in the flesh because we still sin. We still sin and continue to need the sacrifice of Christ to be applied to us. So God gives us a measure of his spirit, a spirit of power that enables us to overcome and helps us to succeed where we fall short. And as we use that spirit and follow its lead, we begin to grow, we grow in character. The mind of Christ starts to grow and develop in us and it begins to change us, change us to be acceptable before God. In other words, being able to walk worthy, to receive those things that God desires in, in the end to give us. So what's involved? What's involved in walking worthy of our calling? There's a section in scripture that has much to say on the subject. It's found in the first chapter of the book of Colossians. So let's turn there, Colossians chapter one, and we're gonna notice a few things about our Christian walk. Colossians chapter one. Colossians chapter one. Paul begins here as he does with many of his letters. In the introduction, he says, to the saints and to the faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae. We're gonna spend a lot of time here in, in Colossians 1, so if you wanna mark this section, we'll come back to here a number of times. Colossians 1, verse three. It says, we give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit, as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew of the grace of God and truth. As you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. That's a pretty long sentence, but it, it says quite a bit about the calling that God has offered to us. Now we might consider that Epaphras himself is actually a great example, a great example of one who walked worthy of his calling. He was indeed a convert of Paul, and they were very close friends. He spent some time in prison with Paul and likely is the one who actually started the church in Colossae, which was his own, his own hometown. And he served the brethren there very well. And they had indeed a great, great love for him as did Paul. Now the word love here in verse four, a love for all the, all the saints is the Greek word agape or godly love. It's that love for the brethren that identifies us as God's children. And how do we know that? Well, as a reference, John chapter 13, verse 35. This is a reference, John 13, verse 35, which says, by this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So that's, that's how we are recognized to be a part of God's family, a part of those he is working with, if we have love for one another. The same word for love is used here in Colossians chapter 1, verse 8 that we just read. Your love of the Spirit. That love was a result of God's Spirit working in them. It was not just a natural affection. Now the Jewish New Testament translated, translates it as the love which the Spirit has given you. The love which the Spirit has given you. Continuing on here in Colossians chapter 1, we'll read through uh, chapter 9 through ver uh, verse, excuse me, Colossians chapter 1, verse 9 through 14. Let's read through that, then we're going to go back and we're going to look at a few points in that section of verses. So Colossians 1, verse 9. It says, For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled 
with the knowledge of his will and in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who, all, who has glorified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and he has conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love in whom we, in whom, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. In light of the faith and love shown by those at Colossae, which was evidenced by their personal commitment, Paul prays that they would indeed continue to grow in all wisdom and in spiritual understanding. Now we know, of course, that we aren't to remain the same as when we were, when we were first called. We're not to remain the same. We have to be growing. We have to be maturing spiritually. Now there's a warning in Hebrews chapter 5 that we're familiar with. Let's turn to that, Hebrews chapter 5, and we'll look at verses 12 through 14. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 through 14. We need to make sure that what's discussed here in these verses doesn't actually apply to us. Now, leading into this, it's discussing Christ's role as the high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. So breaking into the context here in verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 12, it says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again from the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food, for everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness. For he is a babe, but solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And again, we hope that those verses don't apply to us. I'd like to read them again here. This is from the New Living Translation. It's a little more direct, a little more emphatic, but it really gets the point across. Hebrews 5, well, this is beginning in verse 11, again from the New Living Translation. It says, there is much more we would like to say about this. Again, this was discussing Christ as, as of the order of Melchizedek. Much more we would like to say about this, but it is difficult to explain, especially since you are spiritually dull and don't seem to listen. You have been believers so long now that you ought to be teaching others, but instead you need someone to teach you again the basic things about God's Word. You are like the babies who need milk and cannot eat or drink who cannot eat solid food for someone must someone who gives for someone who lives on milk is still an infant and doesn't know how to do what is right solid food is for those who are mature who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong again that's a caution a warning that Paul gives that something we hopefully does not apply to us now we can relate to the fact that if we indeed become lax, if we become lax and, and get away from prayer and study, it's very hard, very hard to get back to it again, once again. That understanding we once had, the level of understanding is, is hard to come back to that. It's like having to learn to relearn, to walk all over again. Ephesians 5, this is a reference, Ephesians 5 and verse 17. Ephesians 5:17 it says therefore do not be unwise but understand what the will of the Lord is the intent is that we be not foolish or wasteful in how we use our time but seek to understand God's will and then of course to do it in the book of Colossians chapter 1 Paul was praying that they would grow in true spiritual discernment and that they would fully understand what God desired them to do and why well, let's go back here to Colossians 1 once again, and we're going to look at verse 10. Colossians 1, verse 10. Why was it important that they grow spiritually? Verse 10 says, that you may walk worthy of the Lord fully, pleasing Him. Now, thinking about the spring holy days that are now upon us, 
just how do we walk worthy in God's sight? And how do we go about pleasing him? Well, walk in the Jewish New Testament is translated as live lives. Live lives. So that verse would say, live lives worthy of the Lord and entirely pleasing to him. It's all about what we do. It's about what we say, what we think, and what we are becoming. It is the result from how we live, how we live our life. It's learning to walk correctly. A few ways that we can walk worthy are covered in the next couple of verses of this chapter, Colossians 1. So co continuing here in verse 10, one way we walk worthy is by being fruitful in every good work. Being fruitful in every good work. So we must do good works that are fruitful and produce something helpful, something of value. In the Gospel of John, and I'll just read this as a reference because we're going to stay here in Colossians, but the Gospel of John Chapter 15 of verse 8. John 15 of verse 8. It says, By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. So again, one way we please God, one way we walk worthy is by producing fruit or doing good works. Those are Christ's words that we just read there in John. Christ's words, and they come from a passage in, the, in the, uh, what is entitled in many New King James versions as the true vine. We're familiar with that particular section of Scripture as it comes from the Passover service. It says, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. And that's from John 15 verse 5. So we walk worthy of God and our calling by having a spiritual, growth, a spiritual fruit actually developing and actually maturing within us. And that can only happen, of course, if we're connected to the vine or if we have Christ working and living in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. But it's just the characteristics of spiritual fruit. It isn't just that, the characteristics of spiritual fruit, the ones that we're all familiar with from Galatians 5. Those fruits of the Spirit, which are love, joy, peace, and long-suffering, and so on. It's not just those it's by, that are growing and developing in us. It's also doing, doing good works in service to others, motivated, motivated indeed by a genuine love and concern for them. Again, the identifying mark that we are God's children if we have love for one another. Now, Albert Barnes, in his commentary regarding this subject, says this. He says, those who are fruitful in good works are faithful, zealous, humble, devoted, and always abounding in the work of the Lord. This kind of character honors God. And that's how we honor God. That's how we walk worthy, is by doing those things and allowing those fruits to grow and develop in us. Continuing again in Colossians 1, verse 10, another way we walk worthy, it says, and by increasing in the knowledge of God. Increasing in the knowledge of God. So we must increase in the knowledge of God, which is what we do, as Scripture says, by studying to show ourselves approved. Studying to show ourselves approved and rightly dividing the word of truth. And that's from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Studying to show ourselves approved. So we have to put in the effort. We can't just go along on autopilot. It takes effort. It takes work. It's part of our apprenticeship training, putting forth effort to learn how God thinks, to learn what his purpose is and what he expects of us. It takes a lot of effort. And by doing those things, we work toward becoming worthy or becoming more acceptable to receive the blessings that God has promised to us. And as physical beings, we have, of course, limitations, limitations in this, but with the power of God's Spirit, that enables us to begin to understand spiritual things. It opens our minds. It allows us to begin to understand. In the Bible, God gives us what he wants us to know. Actually, he gives us what we actually need to know, what we need to know at this time. But it requires a lifetime of effort on our part to learn what we can from it. It doesn't happen with just a partial commitment. It takes a complete commitment, a lifetime commitment because we actually belong to God. We've given ourselves to Him. It takes a lifetime commitment that has to continue on for as long as we live. 
Back in Colossians 1, verse 11. Let's look at another point there. Colossians 1, verse 11. It says, Strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy. That's another way to be counted worthy of in God's sight, is by long suffering. Now, long suffering probably isn't one we often like to think about. It's probably one of the more important ones, actually. Notice this aspect begins with an encourage, encouraging inst, uh, statement. It says, We are strengthened with all, with all might according to or by His glorious power. So that's a, a statement of encouragement. We're strengthened. We are strengthened with all might according to or by His glorious power. And we're strengthened for what? For all patience and long suffering. As we learn to bear these things, as it says, with joy, we begin to be counted worthy, counted worthy of our calling. And it generates a heartfelt joy within us, realizing that we suffer as Christ also suffered. The suffering is but for a little while. It won't last forever. It will indeed come to an end. Patience. Patience is that very difficult thing as we live in this very fast-paced, very overcrowded world that we live in. How much joy do we find in waiting in the checkout line at the supermarket or sitting in traffic unable to get where you need to be? Those indeed are very minor things in the overall picture, but they are certainly the things we go through and suffer through in the, at this time. And what about long suffering, the challenging and difficult thing it is to to be able to, or to have to endure debilitating illnesses, for example, or, or to suffer fi uh, financial crises. Those are very difficult things to have to endure. It takes patience. It takes long suffering. Physical things that we can, that can indeed be very difficult for us to deal with over time, but God is there to help us through those things. The, important more, the more important tests are indeed spiritual in nature, aren't they? It's, the more important things are the spiritual aspects of it. Religious persecution is going to be indeed a very great issue, likely in the very near future, just as it was in the time of the early church. You know, they faced many instances of, of uh, persecution because of the way they believed, the way they lived. Religious persecution is going to be a very great issue in the near future. And we can survive that. We can survive it even with uh, even the very difficult times with God's help and the help of His Spirit. Verse 11 there in Colossians 1 described it as God's glorious power that would give us that strength we needed to be able to endure those things. It's not of any human origin, but it is God's power which gives us, which He indeed gives us and will give us in the day of trial. Let's look back now to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. We're going to read verses 3 through 5. 2 Thessalonians 1 verses 3 through 5. It says, We are bound to thank God always for you, to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly. And the love of every one of you abounds toward each other, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure, which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. Of course, that kingdom of God is the goal that we all look forward to. It's the goal that we all hope to reach. Now, Jesus Christ told his, father, his followers that they would face persecution. They would face persecution just like he did. It's something that we have to expect as Christians, as we live our lives as Christians in this day and age. Just as a reference, 1 John chapter 3, verse 13. 1 John 3, verse 13 says, Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you if the world does hate you. And we're going to see that as a church, that hatred is going to come toward us when the church is indeed thrust more into the public eye because of our beliefs 
because our beliefs are totally contrary to the most popular beliefs of the society around us, the current trends of society. Our beliefs and practices are opposite to that. So Jesus Christ clearly told his followers, including us, that these are things we should expect. We need to expect them. In the Gospel of John, John 15, verses 18 and 19, let me read that for you here. John 15, verses 18 and 19 says, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet, because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. And why does the world hate us? Well, it's because we're so different from them. We're different from them, and, and we make them feel uncomfortable. When they get to know us, they realize we re represent a way of life that they indeed reject, the way of life that they don't understand. And deep down, they actually feel a sense of guilt. They don't want to give up what, they often, what is indeed often a perverse way of life. They don't want to give it up. They've accepted it. They claim it's their right to be able to do those things. And that's the result, of course, of deceit and the wrong attitude that is broadcast by Satan, the god of this world. They're deceived into fighting against us, fighting against that which would be for their ultimate good. Now we know that there will always be trials and tribulations that will indeed test our own character, test our character, test our faith, our faith in God. This feast season, the spring feast season, is about our commitment. It's about our commitment to overcome that. And we know that religious persecution is certainly going to increase as we get closer to the end of this age. As Paul said there in 2 Thessalonians, these are things we must endure. We have to endure them. We're in a battle for our spiritual lives. It is sometimes easy for us to forget that as we get swallowed up in our daily activities and that we're able to continue to assemble here, assemble here in peace and comfort. The real severity of what is yet to come hasn't actually touched us yet, but it will someday. Jesus Christ himself again points out the extent that we must be willing to carry out our way of life, to carry, out, to carry it out, to live it to the end. It's a very serious matter that requires indeed a total commitment on our part. Let's notice Christ's words in Luke chapter 14. In Luke chapter 14 and verse 27. Luke chapter 14 and verse 7, or 27, excuse me. It says, and whatever, or excuse me, and whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. That's a reference to being willing to suffer suffer rejection and persecution as we walk in God's way, just like Christ suffered, even to the extent of losing our physical life if, necess if it's necessary. We must be willing to suffer as Christ did, a total commitment in order that we can be worthy of becoming heirs with him. So we have to do the same thing. He set the example for us. We have to follow that example in every way. A great change took place, of course, in Christ's own disciples after his crucifixion and after his resurrection. Up until that time, they missed the point. They missed the point very often of his teaching, and they certainly did not grasp the level of commitment they needed to make. When the time got very difficult, they basically deserted Christ. But after his resurrection, their attitude completely changed. After they once received the gift of God's Holy Spirit. Let's look at Acts chapter 5. Verses 41 through 42. Acts chapter 5, verses 41 and 42. We find leading up to these verses that the apostles are doing a mighty work. They're preaching the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Christ, and they're doing many mighty signs and wonders by healing the sick. But they were then arrested, they were put in prison. They were told not to preach in that name anymore. And an angel helped them escape from prison, and they went back to the temple and began preaching in the name of Christ again. This time around, they were brought again before the high priest, and they were beaten. 
They were beaten and they were given another warning. Acts chapter 5, verse 41 says, So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Will we be able to do the same? It's a, they set the example. Will we, we be able to follow that? Verse 42, it says, And daily in the temple and in every house they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. So they endured. They endured the persecution that they were exposed to. Are we committed to that same level? How often do we think about and consider those things? If we continue to live a few years longer here, these things will indeed become a reality. Persecution will come. Will we be counted worthy? Will we walk worthy of the calling that God has called us to? Let's look at James chapter 1. James chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 2 through 4. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. This is a familiar section of Scripture. It relates to this point. James 1, verses 2 through 4. It says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete and lacking nothing. And why? Why do we need to do that? That you may be counted worthy. That you may be counted worthy. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verses 10 and 11. 1 Peter chapter 5 verses 10 and 11. These verses give us hope. They give us encouragement. Encouragement that we can actually count on. 1 Peter 5, verse 10, it says, But may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Will we make the total commitment, the total commitment to endure to the end, even through suffering, committed to being counted worthy? Back again in Colossians chapter 1, verse 12, we'll look at one more way that we can walk worthy of our calling. Colossians 1, verse 12. Colossians 1, verse 12, it says, Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. So we're to be thankful. There's reasons for our being thankful. Verse 13 covers the basis for that. It says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Indeed, some very powerful reasons why we should be thankful. It is indeed important that we are always thankful thankful for the amazing things that God has done for us, the many blessings that we've received. Paul always expressed great thankfulness in his letters for the brethren and for the spiritual growth that they were showing. We, of course, must also show, thank, be also show thankfulness to God for opening our minds so we wouldn't have any understanding of his way of life at all if he hadn't opened our minds, opened our minds to understand his way, his truth, in these verses, he says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us. The King James Version says, made us meet. The Greek word used there means to make sufficient, to make abundant or much. The word conveys the idea of having sufficient or enough to accomplish anything. Having enough to accomplish anything, but not an overabundance to the point that we forget where it actually comes from. So we always have to give God the thanks and appreciation for what, for what he helps us to be able to do. According to Albert Barnes in his commentary, the use of this word here implies the idea of conferring the privilege or the ability to be thus made the partakers of the kingdom, to render us fit for it. It doesn't mean we're rendered fit by our own merits 
talents or abilities or by anything we have done. It says God has rendered us fit, made us sufficient to complete the task or to reach the goal. So God has set us apart. He's called us. He's opened our minds. He sanctified us for a very special purpose in his plan. In that sense, then, he has potentially made us meet or rendered us fit to receive his promise of eternal life. But again, we have our part to do, don't we? We have an involvement in the task. We've been given this very special opportunity, of course, to be partakers. We are heirs with Christ of the kingdom of God. And God, of course, doesn't make mistakes. So he gives us everything we need, everything we need to be able to succeed, to reach that goal that he has set for us, for us or before us. He intently desires that we succeed, each and every one of us. But we can be found to be not worthy if we fall short, if we fail to commit ourselves totally to that calling. So we can fall short. And that's part of our focus as we look forward to the Passover and the festival of the un days of the unleavened bread. And as we think about the sacrifice that was given for us and the need for our, us to ex actually examine ourselves, Jesus Christ gave us a warning on several occasions that there are situations that can indeed render us not worthy. Let's notice Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, verses 37 and 38. Again, this is the words of Jesus Christ, and it is a warning to us. Matthew chapter 10, verses 37 and 38. says, He who loves the father or mother, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves a son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. So it's all about priorities, isn't it? And we, we know that we're supposed to, or we need to very much love our families and so forth, but he's talking about priori priorities. What is more important? Where is our commitment? Let's turn back now to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians 2, we're going to look at two final scriptures here. 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 10 through 13. First Thessalonians 2, verses 10 through 13. says, You are witnesses, and God also, who devoutly and justly and blamelessly we have be <clears throat> and how devoutly and justly and blamelessly we behaved ourselves among you who believe. As you know, we have exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father does his own children, that you would walk worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. For this reason, we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. We must continue in all of these ways to walk worthy of our calling, so that we can be received, or so that we might receive the inheritance promised to us. It's a process that, of course, takes time. Mr. Franks oft, often states that we must mature as Christians and that that maturity doesn't happen overnight. It requires a lifetime, a lifetime of effort. In a recent sermon that Mr. Franks gave, he made the statement that if you are in the kingdom of God, you must exhibit characteristics of the kingdom of God. We know, of course, that we can't earn salvation, but we must walk diligently, or work diligently, to walk worthy of, to be able to qualify, so that we might be partakers of the fabulous opportunities that God has prepared for us. For one final scripture, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 2 Thessalon Thessalonians chapter 1, we're going to read verses 11 and 12. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. It says, Therefore we also pray always for you that our God would count you worthy. 
which he will do if we, of course, do our part. But he's not going to force us. He's going to help us as we strive to become worthy. We pray that our God would count you worthy of, of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ might be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Spring holy days are upon us. It's indeed a very sobering time, but it's also an exciting and an encouraging time when we focus on God's plan and our part in it. We're required to prepare ahead of time, to pre prepare ahead of time for these days. Understanding what it is required is, of course, revealed to us through the hearing of the word, but we must then do it. We must put in the effort to remove physical leavening from our homes and actually examine ourselves spiritually in order to repent, to remove any sin that God will show us is still there. It takes time, it takes effort. It takes effort, like learning to walk as a young child. For a young child, learning to walk involves many bumps and bruises often along the way. They experience many lumps and bruises as they learn to walk. But the very successful end result is indeed a thrilling experience, and it opens a whole new world for that little child. And the same is true for us once we learn to walk God's way. Learning to walk worthy of our calling is a continuing lifelong preparation process that we must engage in once we have been called to God's truth. The successful result of that process, as promised by God, will indeed be a future so magnificent we can only vaguely begin to imagine it.